Well, good evening. What an honor it is for me tonight to introduce Granger Smith. Granger Smith is a Baptist seminarian, former country music star, also known as Earl Dibbles Jr. Granger has released 11 albums and in 2016 had a number one hit, Back Road Song, and in 2017 had a second top 10 hit with If the Boot Fits. Granger is also a best-selling author and in 2022 was a featured actor in the movie Moonrise. After 24 years as an award-winning, platinum-selling country music star, Granger chose to leave the music industry and join the ministry. Granger was born in Dallas, Texas, attended Texas A&M University, and currently lives north of Austin, Texas with his wife, Amber, and their children. Please join me in a warm Underwood welcome for Granger Smith. Good evening. My name is Granger. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. My wife is Amber, and we have four children. London, who's 12. Lincoln, who is 10. River, who we lost when he was three. And little Maverick, who's two and a half. We are members at Emmaus Church in Georgetown, Texas. And you could say that most of my social and public life now revolves around that church. I'm st standing out here listening to the, to the introduction, and, and I hear, you know, the, the accolades, and, um, and I think it'd be appropriate to, to address that here this evening and propose the question to you, well, after hearing that, what happened to Granger Smith? Not me, I, I mean the product, the singer, songwriter, the touring musician. What happened to him? I'll give you three answers here. Number one, the road is tough. I toured for 24 years. Sometimes a man gets burnt out. Two, losing my son has caused me to see what is more important in life, and that is spending more time with my family. Number three, I lost my son, and because of that, I lost part of myself. I lost my passion. Now, those answers sound right. And I don't think anyone in this room would blame me if I gave you any of those answers. And I certainly wouldn't if the tables were turned with you. But all three of those answers are wrong and far from the truth. Number one, as, as far as being burnt out, I love music. I, I love writing it. And I love recording it and performing it, and I love traveling with my road brothers and delivering it to people. And so, no, I never got burnt out. Number two, as far as realizing that spending time with my family is the most important thing, I don't believe that. Spending quality time with my family is very important to me. But by no means does that make it my purpose in life. Instead, time with my family is a byproduct of purpose. And besides, music never took that away from me. I was always purposeful and staying present and focused at home and time blocking on the calendar for time with my wife and kids. And on the contrary, now you could say I'm probably busier now than I ever was as a, as a touring musician. And I travel much farther. In, in fact, the last 12 months of I've worked in Cambodia and Thailand and UAE and Pakistan and Cuba and Israel. And this year, Lord willing, I'll return to most of those places, plus Honduras and India and, Lord willing, even places I, I don't even know about yet. So, no, I didn't leave music so I could spend more time with my family. And then lastly, 
Maybe it's because after losing my son, I lost part of myself. And this one is partly true, but I didn't lose part of myself. I died to all of myself. And as far as the passion, I've always been a passionate person, but I can assure you, I am more passionate now than I have ever been in my life. So no, it's not that either. So if, if none of these are correct, then what in the world happened to Granger Smith? He asked off his record label, took himself off the active booking agency roster. He sold the tour buses and the semi-truck, gave that money to the band and crew who have now joined other bands with no chance of ever getting back together. Why? Well, if those three answers are false, then to give up that good life, he must have found something that's better. And I'll tell you what I told the crowd on my final show of my farewell tour. In the book of Matthew, chapter 13, Jesus is telling a parable. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field that a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I don't think there's a better answer than that for me. I found a treasure, and to have it is worth giving up everything. The question I want to answer today instead is not what happened to Granger Smith. Maybe better asked it would be, why did this happen? And to that, this evening, I have four points to answer that question. I would have to tell you about a devastating day, a nefarious night, a miracle morning, and a really bright light. Before I tell you those four things, let's pray. God, you are great. There is no one like you. Humble me on this stage. I don't want to be driven by applause or approval of man, even though my flesh so desperately wants the approval of these people on this stage. Lord, shield me from that. Let, it you, let you be known. Let you speak through me. Use me as your servant this evening. Do it for Christ's sake. Amen. The devastating day was June 4th, 2019. It was the day before the CMT Music Awards, and I was home in Texas. I had an early flight booked on the 5th to go to Nashville for media and red carpet and the award show and then a label party. Then I would go out and join the band in the Midwest for our typical June fairs and festivals that weekend. But I never made it to any of that. I was in the backyard with my three kids the night of the fourth evening, enjoying my time at home. Beautiful day. June is beautiful in Texas. We have big blue skies and white puffy clouds, green grass under my bare feet. And I was playing in the backyard with my daughter. She was going through a gymnastics routine that she'd made up. She loved to do that. And I was holding her ankles, and she was doing a handstand. The boys were playing water gun fight next to me. And I remember thinking, wow, soak up this moment, because these moments won't last forever. And soon after I had that thought, I thought of something else. It's quiet. Where's River? He's our three-year-old. When you have a three-year-old, it's not often quiet. Just saw him a few minutes ago, but I looked over my left shoulder, and inside our fenced, gated, and locked pool was River in the middle of the pool, face down, floating. 
I couldn't comprehend that sight. I still can't. I ran through the gate, crashed into the water, took him into my arms, thinking I would flip him over and he would be crying and coughing, scared, and I would say, River, what are you doing? How'd you get in here? Buddy, you know you're not supposed to get in here by yourself. What are you doing? That's not what happened. Instead, he was lifeless, cold. Skin was blue. His eyes were open. His limbs were hanging like a ragdoll. I took him to the side of the pool and started CPR. I didn't know how to do that. My daughter, who was with me, came running, screaming. I said, go get your mama. She was in the house. My wife, Amber, comes running out. I said, I need my phone. I didn't have my phone on me. She turned around and went back to get my phone. We called 911, and dispatch began walking me through on speakerphone CPR. But it took emergency services about 10 minutes to arrive after that because we lived out in the country. By the time they got there, they were able to revive his heartbeat with electric shock. There was a huge relief. We jumped in the car, we chased the ambulance to the hospital. I felt like I dodged a big bullet. When we got to the hospital with his heartbeat plugged into the breathing machine. He got all his color back. He started looking good. He was warm. It looked like he was sleeping. We felt better. About 24 hours later, a doctor came in and he said, Mr. Smith, I need to tell you, there is zero chance of your son ever living again. It's now up to you to tell us when to unplug the machine. My life was wrecked. What do you do? What do you do? You know, there's never been a time in my life when I did not call myself a Christian. As early as I could remember, as a kid, I was going to church, going to Sunday school, singing songs about Jesus, reciting a few famous Bible verses. I was baptized when I was 12, had a cultural attachment to Christianity throughout my teen years. I would cry at church camps as the worship bands vamped pretty music, and I would feel an emotional high as I accepted Jesus into my heart in those dimly lit concert halls and church auditoriums. Yes, I believed I was a Christian, and I always defended my religion against anyone who might say otherwise. But somewhere along the line, as decades went by of life and music business, things changed. Not my belief that I was a Christian, that didn't change, but the way I lived is evidence of it. Let me, exp let me explain with the, the, perfect, uh, the perfect symbolism behind me here. If I told you I was an avid deer hunter, you would expect me to live a lifestyle that reflected evidence of that claim. I would know my way around a rifle and a bow. I would have a good knowledge about things like scent block and camo, tree stands. I would probably love the taste of venison, all the different ways you can cook it, and the, and the study of the art of field dressing animals and carefully sharpened skinning knives. I would no doubt have some shoulder-mounted bucks on my walls and good stories to tell you about how they got there. And most importantly, I would be someone who actively seeks time in the woods and craves to spend more and more time there and desperately wants to share that time with others so that they too could be filled with the same joy that I get out of hunting. So let me ask you this evening, is that the same for you as someone who calls themselves a Christian? You see, by 2019, somehow I had become a professing Christian that was more about heritage and culture and less about a life of surrender to a Savior. And it's not hard to look back 
on my life and see how I was slowly conditioned to this. The music business, over time, it rewards the relentless, diligent work of the individual. When things don't go well, fewer people believe in us. And when fewer people believe in us, the more we buckle down and focus inward and develop ourselves, by ourselves, for ourselves. And then after a while, when we finally start having some success, people say, wow, everybody loves you. And we think, nobody loved me. Nobody believed in me until I worked, I sacrificed, I overcame, I succeeded. And this is not isolated to the music business. I wonder how many men in this room this evening have built a livelihood on that same mentality. Welcome to America, right? That's what we do here. We scratch and claw and squeeze our way up to the table to help ourselves to a piece of that American pie. And so, as a cultural Christian full of that pie, who was conditioned to overcome adversity by carrying on my own burden. That's exactly how I approached the crippling grief and guilt of failing as a father for losing my son. I took it upon myself. I woke up in the mornings at 5 a.m., meditated by emptying my mind for about 10 minutes, and then I would focus on my breath read a page from a Christian devotional, journaled my thoughts, made a list of things I was grateful for, read or listened to some sort of self-help book or a podcast on the way to the gym, worked out, counted my macros and my calories, cut out alcohol, went to therapy, continued touring, helped others process their own loss with my new found empathy. I built a system Grief would not control me. I would defeat it with self-discipline. Even though I was secretly crippled by what I call the slideshow. The slideshow was PTSD flashbacks of River, visions of him. Face down in a pool, lifeless, cold, Purple skin, eyes open, pupils rolling around in the back of his head, hair all messed up, CPR in the wet concrete, a pump in his chest, thinking, don't press too hard, you might break his sternum, and then thinking, maybe it's too late to worry about that now, hearing those sirens screaming through what was a beautiful Texas countryside. Doctor, the hospital says, no chance of survival. My son Lincoln's hand on that Lightning McQueen coffin at his best friend's funeral. That slideshow would pop into my mind randomly at any time in a conversation with someone on the stage in the, right in the middle of a song late at night. You know, when a man is drowning, he will do anything to find the air. I used a marijuana vape pen to help mitigate that slideshow. As it turned out, it was pretty much the only way I was able to relax and sleep at night. This was my life for the first six months after losing River. That's how I survived until the nefarious night. The nefarious night was in late December 2019 in Boise, Idaho. We were playing back-to-back -back shows in Boise, so we didn't have to travel. It's really nice when you're touring to be able to park the buses in one spot, and you don't have to travel in between shows. You actually get a good night's sleep. Things were going really well on this tour. Just, we'd been through a lot. And to see the success of a tour 
and to be rewarded from all that hard work, all that self-discipline, everything I had built at therapy. The, the, you know, I still had bad days, and, but I would have slightly good days, and things were getting better, and then we had a really good show in Boise. And I thought, man, I just, I'm feeling better. I think I'm on the way to recovery. And one of the band guys said, hey, after the show, you want to come over here and just have a few drinks with the guys? I know you haven't done that in a long time, Granger, but, you, you know, we're, we're parked here, and, and there's a spot away from all the fans, a little hole-in-the-wall bar. No one will find us, just us in there. Have a few drinks. And I said, yes, that, that sounds great. Let's do that. So I went and met the guys, had a drink or two. Remember, just whiskey on ice because I didn't want extra calories. Got to stick with the system that I'd built. Had another drink. We laughed. We told stories. We remembered the old days in the van, all the old shows that we played and the adversity we had overcome. A few more drinks, a few more drinks, a few more drinks. I thought, all right, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head to bed. It's good to see everybody. And I remember our sound guy said, hey, Granger, it's good to see you like this again, boss. And I said, Thank you, buddy. It feels good to, to feel normal. It feels good to feel normal. And I walked out into that frigid, cold, boisey air. And I got up to my bus, and I started typing in the code to the keypad on the lock. I couldn't remember it. It's like, man, my, I, I had had so many drinks, I was just fumbling with that keypad. And I thought, what in the world? I'd entered this code a thousand times. I couldn't think of it. Five, seven. Finally got it open. And walked in, into the bus and kind of stumbled my way to my back room in the back of that bus. And that room instantly reminded me, things aren't normal. Got my little self-help books laying out on the bed. A little marijuana vape pen plugged in, charging in my nightstand. And I remembered, things aren't normal. And I thought, man, this is the first time you've had this many drinks since you lost River. And then I thought... Huh, you think I'll be able to withstand the slideshow and all the therapy I worked on when I'm drunk? Slideshow kicked in, vivid, bright, rivers in the pool. I crash in, I flip him over, his eyes are wide open. I hear those sirens screaming down that country road, Fire trucks and ambulances all screaming, reminding me of the father, the failure that I am as they race into our little house. We go to the hospital and that doctor, the doctor with the mustache comes in with a cold face and he says, I'm so sorry to tell you, no chance. I'm going into a panic mode in the back of this bus. Tears are flowing down my face. I grab for that pin, turn it on, and I take it and it does nothing only makes it worse. I'm losing my mind, crying. Tears are hitting the floor. I open the drawer. I pull out what I know is the only thing that could save me. Good old King James Bible. No, it wasn't that. It was a Glock 9 millimeter. Put it in my mouth. Panic attack. And it was in this moment, it felt like five minutes, it was probably 10 seconds, I noticed something. I noticed, and I, I try to tell this with as much clarity as I can, I thought a thought that wasn't generated by me. There was a thought that came into my mind that I didn't create. And that thought said something like this. This is the way. This is the way to peace. This is the way to finally rest. Just squeeze. And I knew. I knew in that moment, I'm not alone in this bus. In fact, I don't know how long I've been with this, this other presence with me that had me surrounded outmanned, outgunned, pinned in the corner, about to kill me, and I had nothing to defend myself with. My worthless things that I had built, 
my worthless self-dependence and self-discipline, all of it was trash to this enemy. And something in me, a knee-jerk reaction, reaching far back to when I was just a kid, maybe because of my praying mother, I cried out the one thing I only knew how to do is, Jesus, save me, please. Jesus, please save me. Jesus, please save me. The slideshow stopped. The voice stopped. The thought stopped. I felt peace enough to drop the gun. Fell down to my knees. Curled up in the ball with my show clothes on. And sobbed myself to sleep, repeating, just to make sure nothing came back into my mind. Jesus, please save me. Jesus, please. Jesus, please save me. I woke up that next morning embarrassed, hungover, still on the floor. But after that night, I had a new goal, a new purpose, one question. Who is Jesus, really? And that, that might sound silly to some of you. Oh, but I encourage you to think about that. Not just the namesake of the Christian faith. Not just the subject of a pastor or the frail image on a crucifix or the kind face on a Renaissance painting. Who is this King of Kings, Lord of Lords, this Alpha and Omega? The one whose name I called out that could silence the most sinister of enemies. Now, finding the answer to this became my new obsession. Everything in my life was about to change. I didn't tell anyone about that nefarious night, not even my wife. It was too personal, too embarrassing, too confusing. So I set out on this new mission alone. My first thought was, I need a preacher. First name that came to mind was Billy Graham. To be honest, it was the only name that came to mind. I didn't know any others. I found Billy Graham on YouTube and to my surprise, there was hundreds of Billy Graham sermons on YouTube, and they continue to upload them. Some of them are old and black and white, and he has dark hair. And some of them are color, and he has white hair. But he was always in front of a huge crowd. And his messages were comfortably true. Uh, they were predictable. They were predictable. I, they were about 20 minutes long each. He would start with a gospel reading out of one of the four gospels, he would then relate some kind of pop music or, or uh, media reference, and then he would tie the gospel together and have an invitation. I watched these over and over and over and over and over. I would brush my teeth and watch them. I would be taking a shower, and there would be my phone sitting in the shower. I was watching it. I just wanted to know. I wanted to know more about the one that saved me on that tour bus because there had to be more than what I thought as a kid, as a teenager. That's who I was leading up to the miracle morning, which was March 1st, 2020. By the time the miracle morning happened to me, that algorithm on YouTube had now kicked up a bunch of pastors. And so there's a bunch of faithful teachers teaching me through YouTube. And I had pretty much replaced all of my little routine of self-help and devotionals and uh, my, my podcast. I I'd pretty much replaced it with pastors. Still curious, still wanting to know. But to be honest, in hindsight, it hadn't really clicked yet until March 1st, 2020. I was listening to a sermon. The pastor was teaching out of the book of John, chapter 14. And the disciple asked Jesus, Lord, why is it that you manifest yourself to us, the disciples, but not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The pastor commentates right here, that's not unconditional love. That is profoundly conditional. He repeats it. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
and my Father will love him in a way that he doesn't love the whole world. This wrecked me. This absolutely wrecked me. Because on that tour bus, when I called out to him, when he saved me, redeemed me, restored me, forgave me, adopted me as a son, he's saying, the ones that you could tell that love me are marked as the ones who keep my word. You see, not because keeping his word causes him to love us. He loves us first. But you could tell those people that are loved first because those are the people that keep his word. And I thought right then, I thought, I'm one of them. And I don't know his word. I don't know it. And suddenly, all I wanted to do was know it. How was I going to keep a word? Lord, you saved me. You loved me. I'm one of yours, and yet I don't know your word. How do I know it all? I went home, and I told my wife, Amber, I said, babe, we got to know his word. She was like, okay. I said, we've got to read our Bibles. So we threw away the devotionals. We sidelined them. We took our Bibles out, knocked the dust off of them, and we started reading. Started in Matthew 1. I thought that was a pretty good place to start, birth of Christ. Made it all the way to Revelation. But then Jesus said that Moses and the prophets were talking about him, so I had to go to Genesis and start reading through that as well because I didn't want to miss any of his word if I was going to keep it. My keeping God's word was not earning my way to salvation. Instead, it was an overflow of gratitude from the salvation that was already earned for me. I began to understand the analogy of the deer hunter. Regardless of all the systems and self-discipline, when disaster struck my family, being a cultural Christian could not save me because being a cultural Christian is not being a Christian at all. Being a cultural Christian is not being a Christian at all, do you see? Being a deer hunter that never spends time in the woods is not a deer hunter. He just says that he is. Real deer hunters are marked as those who spend time in the woods. And Christians are marked as those who keep the word of God. As I spent more and more time reading the Bible, that question was being answered for me. That question that asked, who is Jesus? And let me tell you, believers here this evening, everything that you do, in your coming, in your going, in your joy, in your suffering, in your worship, revolves around knowing who He is. And you can only really know who He is as He has revealed Himself through His Word. And if you don't mind... I would love to pause my story right here and tell you just a fraction of who the Bible says that he is. May I do that? The Bible says, by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace of the blood of his cross. He totally embodies all knowledge and wisdom and authority and providence and power and purity and truth and word and justice and dignity and integrity and patience and obedience and meekness and humility and tenderness and wrath and grace and love and gladness and joy. We were made to know the one who is supreme in all of these things. We were not made to waste our time chasing the peace and comfort from fleeting, meaningless things, all the while believing the lies that the world tells us, like, you need to forgive yourself. 
or you need to help yourself, or that anything from yourself that you've accomplished is actually from yourself at all. Everything comes from Him. He rules over every maverick molecule in the outermost reaches of deep space, every delicate hummingbird egg in a canopy of a rainforest, every pebble of stone untouched by light at the bottom of the deepest trench in the Pacific Ocean, every grain of sand in the sun-scorched Sahara Desert. He is totally over all the rotation of the earth, the rise of the tide, every hurricane, tornado, drought, virus, rescue mission, and cure, every government, politician, king, president, terrorist, gang, mafia, cartel, all news, sports, science, aborted babies, IVF fetuses, and presidential candidate polling, all rule and authority and power and dominion in heaven and on earth, every name above all names, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He rules it all. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's who the Bible says he is. But that's not all. Even with all of this power, our great God, the King of Kings, seeks to have an intimate relationship with his people, even on dark tour buses. And of all things, seeks to serve them with gentleness and humility, saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And even still, we try to fix things on our own. This is to rebel against Him, choosing a deadly American cultural Christianity, believing brilliant lies from the enemy that say things like, I can't go to church, it doesn't fit my schedule. If anything, I'll catch it online. Or, I don't really need to read my Bible, I already read daily devotionals and it has scripture on it. Or, worship is meant to entertain me. Or, I mean, I don't pray all the time. I, I pray a decent amount. God loves to hear all the things that I want from Him. Oh, and hear me on this next one, men. I don't have a daily worship time with my family. That's what youth ministry is for. Not me. 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 Satan loves when we buy into all of these lies. And through that dark oppression... We turn our self-obsession into a God itself. People like me and you. We make idols out of what the world calls normal things when we know that the Bible tells us not to conform to the patterns of the world. Oh, what wretched sinners we are. What have we done? What have we done? We deserve hell. But God, in His loving mercy, because of who He is, entered His own creation as a man to redeem sinners and draw them to Himself, even on dark tour buses. Jesus, in obedience, glorified the Father perfectly in a way that we did not, praised the Father perfectly in a way that we would not, and through his death on the cross and the resurrection from the grave, he satisfied the wrath of God in a way that we could not. That is who the Bible says he is. The way, the truth, the life, the gate, the Savior, the shepherd calling for his sheep who hear his voice, bidding them to come touch his sides, feel the holes in his hands from the nails that our sin drove into him, saying, do you believe me now? That is who the Bible says he is. The one that knows his people as those that have turned from their sin and put their faith in him. To them, he says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
That is who the Bible says he is, the treasure hidden in a field that a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, is that you? Are you sold out for the treasure, for Jesus? Or are you the guy that says he's the hunter and doesn't even go into the woods? I wonder if I've completely answered the question yet, why did this happen to Granger Smith? One more point here. A devastating day, a nefarious night, a miracle morning, and now a really bright light. I'll finish with this. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And if Jesus is the Word, like John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. then we can understand Psalm 119 when it says, the unfolding of your word gives light. And your word is a light to my feet and a light to my path. Brothers and sisters, maybe some of you are wondering what to do next after you hear this. Practically. Nice story, Granger. Nice testimony. But what could I do? What could I start doing at home? It's a good question. First, know this. There is nothing you can do to earn your favor with God. The only good standing you have with Him, talking to Christians here, the only good standing you have with Him has been accomplished by Jesus on the cross, and His righteousness is transferred to you in exchange for your faith in Him. Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then Paul continues, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, Brothers and sisters, your next step in response to the gospel, because of the ability made available to you through Christ, is to walk in good works. But how do you do that? That seems pretty broad. What does that even mean? That's why I love 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let me read that again. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, Equipped for every good work, if you desire to be a complete man of God. And I know we have women here too. I didn't expect that. I'm speaking to you too, brethren. If you desire to be complete, equipped for every good work, which God has prepared beforehand for you to walk in, then you need to know that the Bible, the unfolding of the Word, which is the light that awakened me, the lamp to my feet, is also God's way to equip you too. As old-fashioned as it might sound, read it, listen to it, pray it, memorize it, sing it, discuss it, wrestle with it, teach it, sit under faithful preaching of it, and don't replace it with other things of this world. Start tomorrow. Start tonight. Get a daily reading plan of some sort. Start small if you're new to it. Aim low. Make it one page, one chapter, one paragraph, but don't skip it. Join other people, other brothers and sisters for accountability. Listen to Deuteronomy 11 when it says, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine, these scriptures, 
in your heart and in your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. Talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on your doorpost and your house and on your gates. If you want a practical step in growing your faith, not a checklist for salvation, but in order to arm yourself, Christian, against the problems of the world, and they are coming if they're not with you already. to grow spiritually into the man or woman that Jesus already paid the price for you to be, do this. Do it. Keep his word. Just like Jesus said in John 14, the fact that wrecked me, in order to keep it, start by reading it. And if you don't, the Bible says your heart will be deceived. And you will turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, whatever idols those might be. In other words, if you don't, I fear that you might be the deer hunter who never goes into the woods. I want to say something next here. And as I was preparing for this message this week, I had to really pray over this. Because, Lord, I don't want to say anything that is not from you or that is wrong in any way. But after much prayer and consideration, I feel like what I'm about to tell you is true. There is little chance for meaningful prayer from a man not reading his Bible. There is little chance for meaningful worship from a man not reading his Bible. And there is little chance for a meaningful relationship with Jesus for a man not reading his Bible. And if that's the case, why would you not do it every single day? Why did this happen to Granger Smith? Because Hebrews 4 says, the Word of God, the Bible, is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Brothers and sisters, stand along the psalmist in Psalm 119, declaring, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up in your heart, in your word, in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth and the way of your testimonies. I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 